One question that was asked to me fairly recently was that if I thought there was any episodes of Spongebob that would have a largely different reception if it aired in a different season. And for the most part, the answer is no. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't matter which seasons episodes like A Pal for Gary, One Course Meal, or The Splinter aired on, they'd still be seen as pretty bad. And, provided everything else about the episodes is the same, I'd probably still be in the minority opinion of I'm With Stupid or The Great Snail Race if they aired in season 6 or 7. However, there is one episode that I do think falls into that category. And that would be, it's a Spongebob Christmas. I'm not going to lie, it would be very easy for me to hate this episode because... The episode itself has a very interesting attitude towards modern Spongebob. It seems to pretend that the terrible episodes that came out before it didn't exist. And as such, it tends to dip in what makes bad Spongebob episodes horrible. Spongebob is an idiot. Patrick is a prick. And at other times, the episode seems to ignore some of the horrible things that have happened. The main plot is the townspeople become jerks, pretending that episodes like Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy didn't exist. It's something that can be very hard to ignore, I'll admit that right now. And these quote-unquote problems probably wouldn't exist at all if this episode came out in, say, Season 2. Speaking of which, am I going to compare this episode to Christmas Who? Not really, I don't think it's necessary. The only thing that's really the same between the two is that they both take place on Christmas and they both have Patchy. The story is completely different, although I kind of see this one as a sequel to the original Christmas Who in some ways. Ah yes, Patchy. Considering for once he's animated, that means that I absolutely have to talk about him. And we'll get to those parts when we get to them. But yes, the animation. The most interesting aspect about this episode is that it's made in stop motion. It looks really good from what I can tell. Although I don't know why most of the characters look like they were made out of felt. I never thought the uh, Spongebob characters were supposed to be fuzzy. I say from what I can tell because when it comes to TV grade stop motion, there really isn't much I can compare it to. I mean, there's Glenn Martin, which I'm going to review immediately after Elf Bowling, but that's about it. And comparing this to something like Coraline or The Nightmare Before Christmas isn't anywhere close to fair. All I could say is that the stop motion looks appealing. They get as close to the style of the show as possible, and they do keep a unique edge, so it's not pointless. So let's talk about Patchy. For the sake of keeping things ordered, I'll talk about Spongebob and Patchy separately. But honestly, there's really not much to talk about with Patchy here. Let me give you the 100% bare thing you need to know about Patchy in this episode. It's worlds better than his appearance in Truth or Square. That's not saying much, I know, but it's a place to start. This is for two reasons. The most important is that he doesn't overstay his welcome. A Spongebob Christmas altogether is about 22 minutes, and Patchy doesn't even take up half of it. Hell, I don't think he even makes up a quarter of it. The second reason is that he's not a creeper this time. The worst thing that he does is steal a mail truck in order to get his letter to Santa while holding the mailman hostage. Granted, that's not a good way to start off his segments, but I'm not looking for perfection here. The main plot is Potty and Patchy having a back and forth argument trying to find their way to the North Pole. Eventually they crash and do that classic gag where cartoon characters are starting to starve and want to eat each other. If it sounds minimal, it kinda is. It's mainly a drive to tell a bunch of back and forth jokes, and there is something charming about it. And if you're wondering, Patchy does get his comeuppance for kidnapping the mailman and stealing the mail truck. I mean, if you like Patchy's bits here, great. If you don't, they won't take up too much of your time. I think that it was worth the effort, but I'm more interested in talking about the Spongebob part of the episode. It starts with a musical number because this episode actually is a musical. The musical numbers in this episode are definitely some of the better ones in modern Spongebob. Unlike, say, the song in Tilava Patty or in Atlanta Square Pantis, it sounds like they put effort into them. While I wouldn't download them and listen to them on their own, they're pleasant to listen to, they move the plot along nicely, and they sound very in theme. And yes, the Santa puppet does look pretty bad. Considering how good the other puppets are though, I'm pretty sure that that's intentional. It does look pretty funny. And unlike some of the other weird facial expressions in Season 8, it probably won't give anyone nightmares. Now we come to Patrick. He wants to capture Santa to make sure that it's Christmas all year. And if there's anything I didn't like about this episode, it would be him. But he's not in it for long. And when he does try these stunts to capture Santa, they do end up backfiring, which is pretty funny. Finally, Spongebob enters the tree dome, and he does so without a helmet. And I'd like to take this moment to cover my ass a little bit. When I tend to make an animated atrocity, I do bring up things like Spongebob not wearing his helmet a lot. Patrick's uncharacteristically acting like a jerk. Spongebob is in Sandy's tree dome without a helmet, and people tend to pick apart those little bits in my review, thinking that it undermines my entire argument. There's a difference between a flaw that ruins an episode, and a flaw that provides a minor distraction. Think of it like this. Spongebob not wearing his helmet in Sandy's tree dome is like a spelling mistake on an otherwise really good essay. In a bad episode like Face Freeze, it's a problem, but not the problem. Minor things don't really destroy an episode for me, unless it's something like House Fancy or Peter Problems. And this episode does have a few smaller problems, but it doesn't ruin the overall product. Despite what many people think, 
I don't demand perfection, but it is nice when I can get it. And the positives of this episode significantly outweigh the negatives. For example, the song not only sets up the plot, but it puts each of the major characters into the episode. So many Spongebob specials ignore the secondary characters and instead resort to padding it out with filler and confusing plot lines that don't make much sense. Yes, Mr. Krabs is obviously greedy in this episode, but it seems really in line with his original personality. We learn that Plankton has been naughty, and there's something here that I really like, a freeze frame bonus. You know, spending a little extra time on something that most people probably won't see, to add a little bit of rewatch value or a little bit of polish. If you pause the screen, we see that some of Plankton's evil deeds are larceny, littering, taunting puppies, and neglecting grooming. And due to these deeds, Plankton constantly gets a stocking full of coal. Karen tells him that he would get something better if he wasn't the biggest jerk in Bikini Bottom. And Plankton has a plan for this. He's going to give people fruitcake laced with jerktonium, which basically makes people big fat jerks. The first person Plankton sees is Spongebob, and Spongebob does eat a bunch of the fruitcake, but he doesn't get affected for some reason, even after eating dozens of fruitcakes. Spongebob decides that everyone should eat the fruitcake, and Plankton lets him, downtrodden that his plan has seemingly failed. I really shouldn't have to explain why it's different to something like the Krabby Chronicle, right? Spongebob doesn't know that he's doing something wrong, so he's able to keep his naivete and be undisputably the good guy of the episode. Also, it's Plankton, the show's villain, getting him to do these things. That, that's kind of important. So, Spongebob goes and starts feeding everyone fruitcake, which turns them into jerks. It's becoming more and more clear to me that I probably should have reviewed an episode like Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy before this, but I think I can manage, and I have something else planned for that particular episode. But... In many episodes, the people of Bikini Bottom have been horrendous jerks without the influence of fruitcake. And here's what this episode comes down to, for me at least. I'm not letting what has happened get in the way of what should happen. This is how the people of Bikini Bottom should become jerks. They shouldn't be jerks of their own volition, even in an episode like The Sponge Who Could Fly. Not to mention that their jerkiness is actually funny for once. I want a sled and a truck and a bike. <laughs> Oh. Well, why don't you get a job and buy all that junk yourself? Also, the truck going off the cliff doesn't explode and put Squidward into a full body cast. SpongeBob isn't affected by the Jerktonium because of his innocent love of the holiday, which is definitely something I'm willing to buy. It's better than having him defy the plot because he's the main character. They're coming up with reasons that are relatively reasonable. It's stuff like that that makes it hard for me to pick on the flaws of this particular episode. Agent of naughtiness, go and destroy SpongeBob's good name! Also, it hands me jokes on a metallic platter, which is good for any episode as far as I'm concerned. As the Robo Sponge goes destroying things, we see that the slapstick in this episode is actually funny and not painful for once. SpongeBob eventually finds out that everyone is acting like a horrible jerk, except Patrick. He is acting normal. I think it's pretty obvious, SpongeBob. <laughs> I've eaten fruitcake and set the tiger trap for Santa! Now if you don't mind, I'm kind of busy right now. This gets Spongebob worried. If people don't act nicer, Santa's gonna fly right past Bikini Bottom. Spongebob tries to get help. He goes to Squidward, and Squidward sends him to Sandy. Then Robo Sponge beats Squidward over the head with the door. As long as an actual defiant villain and an antagonist is doing it, it's a start. Okay? It's a start. At Sandy's house, and through some shenanigans, the fruitcake falls into the Christmas magic analyzer that she was building earlier. They learn that the fruitcake is laced with jerktonium. Spongebob is immune to it, though, because he has a tiny brain and a pure heart. But everyone else needs an antidote, which just so happens to be a song. Now, this song was made before the episode, probably before it was even planned out. I don't mind it that much because they didn't make the entire episode just to play the song. Helping it is the fact that I like the song a lot more than the best day ever. The lyrics are way more well thought out and the singing is far more under control. It's also a clever way to show off what they can do with the stop motion animation. This song manages to save everyone in Bikini Bottom, but unfortunately it seems to be too late. Everyone in town is on the naughty list, except Plankton. So he gets the Krabby Patty formula. SpongeBob tries to say something, but apparently he's the worst jerk of all. He's over there right now, wreaking havoc. That's, that's good comedy. Considering the robot wants to destroy Christmas, it attacks Santa and it becomes even bigger. And we have an action-packed climax. It's actually pretty good. When it's destroyed, they find out that the robot belonged to Plankton and they bury him in coal. And that was It's a SpongeBob Christmas. It has its problems, but nothing that destroys the episode or even really harms it. The important characters are completely in character. The story is completely coherent. And the things that they do forget about don't ruin the plot in any way whatsoever. I mean, even Christmas Who had a couple of things like that. After Sandy 
Sandy told SpongeBob what Christmas was, she vanished from the story. And besides that, she probably should have been hibernating. Santa only came to Bikini Bottom after they knew what Christmas was. Still, small stuff. Do I think that this episode is good as Christmas Who? No, but I do think it's in the ballpark. It's nice, and that's the one thing that I really like to say about SpongeBob episodes. One question that was asked to me fairly recently was that if I thought there was any episodes of Spongebob that would have a largely different reception if it aired in a different season. And for the most part, the answer is no. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't matter which season's episodes like A Pal for Gary, One Course Meal, or The Splinter aired on, they'd still be seen as pretty bad. And provided everything else about the episodes is the same, I'd probably still be in the minority opinion of I'm With Stupid or The Great Snail Race if they aired in season 6 or 7. However, there is one episode that I do think falls into that category. And that would be, it's a Spongebob Christmas. I'm not going to lie, it would be very easy for me to hate this episode because... The episode itself has a very interesting attitude towards modern Spongebob. It seems to pretend that the terrible episodes that came out before it didn't exist. And as such, it tends to dip in what makes bad Spongebob episodes horrible. Spongebob is an idiot. Patrick is a prick. And at other times, the episode seems to ignore some of the horrible things that have happened. The main plot is the townspeople become jerks, pretending that episodes like Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy didn't exist. It's something that can be very hard to ignore, I'll admit that right now. And these quote-unquote problems probably wouldn't exist at all if this episode came out in, say, Season 2. Speaking of which, am I going to compare this episode to Christmas Who? Not really, I don't think it's necessary. The only thing that's really the same between the two is that they both take lists on Christmas and they both have Patchy. The story is completely different, although I kinda see this one as a sequel to the original Christmas Who in some ways. Ah yes, Patchy. Considering for once, he's animated, that means that I absolutely have to talk about him. And we'll get to those parts when we get to them. But yes, the animation. The most interesting aspect about this episode is that it's made in stop motion. It looks really good from what I can tell. Although, I don't know why most of the characters look like they were made out of felt. I never thought the uh, Spongebob characters were supposed to be fuzzy. I say from what I can tell because when it comes to TV grade stop motion, there really isn't much I can compare it to. I mean, there's Glenn Martin, which... I'm going to review it immediately after Elf Bowling, but that's about it. And comparing this to something like Coraline or The Nightmare Before Christmas isn't anywhere close to fair. All I could say is that the stop motion looks appealing. They get as close to the style of the show as possible, and they do keep a unique edge, so it's not pointless. So let's talk about Patchy. For the sake of keeping things ordered, I'll talk about Spongebob and Patchy separately. But honestly, there's really not much to talk about with Patchy here. Let me give you the 100% bare thing you need to know about Patchy in this episode. It's worlds better than his appearance in Truth or Square. That's not saying much, I know, but it's a place to start. This is for two reasons. The most important is that he doesn't overstay his welcome. A Spongebob Christmas altogether is about 22 minutes, and Patchy doesn't even take up half of it. Hell, I don't think he even makes up a quarter of it. The second reason is that he's not a creeper this time. The worst thing that he does is steal a mail truck in order to get his letter to Santa while holding the mailman hostage. Granted, that's not a good way to start off his segments, but I'm not looking for perfection here. The main plot is Potty and Patchy having a back and forth argument trying to find their way to the North Pole. Eventually they crash and do that classic gag where cartoon characters are starting to starve and want to eat each other. If it sounds minimal, it kinda is. It's mainly a drive to tell a bunch of back and forth jokes, and there is something charming about it. And if you're wondering, Patchy does get his comeuppance for kidnapping the mailman and 